right, we're just waiting for a few more audience to join in. Great. All right, so I think we can begin. Welcome to lecture series as part of Techniche 2021, the annual techno management festival of the Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. Through lecture series, our goal has always been to facilitate the interaction with remarkable innovators of the various fields. Following our legacy, we bring to you a man who is revolutionizing the microprocessors industry. His initial days were spent working at IBM as the vice president of the microprocessors tech development unit. Then he oversaw the development of the iPod and iPhone at Apple, reporting directly to Steve Jobs. He also was the vice president of the famous networking company, Cisco. At his current position as the Chief Technical Officer of Advanced Micro Devices, or AMD for short, this man has overseen the development of the Zen microprocessor series, which is now at the heart of every Ryzen processor. This man is truly an epitome of innovative prowess and experience. Please, well, please join me in welcoming Mr. Mark Papermaster, the Chief Technical Officer and Executive VP of AMD. Welcome, sir. It is truly an honor to have you here with us today. As a final reminder to our audience, we also have a Discord server where you can watch and discuss this lecture with friends and fellow enthusiasts. We will also be running a Q&A session at the end of the lecture, so if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box below. With that, let's head right on to the event and welcome Mr. Mark Papermaster. Um, thank you very much for that introduction and thanks for letting me join you in Tech Niche 2021. Uh, it's such a, a storied program uh, that you have at uh, IIT Guwahati and uh, it's really, uh, like I said, it's a thrill to join you today. And I could not imagine a better time to join you because it's such an exciting time in our industry and innovation. Innovation is all about what you are focused on at the university. Uh, that is what we need now more than ever in our industry. And so what I'd like to do is share with you a little bit of uh, my experience. I've, I've been working on innovation in, in technology and in computing technology for almost 40 years. And what I, I've learned is uh, that it is uh, a big challenge. You're never bored. You always have uh, lots of uh, tough problems to solve. But I've also learned 
that you have to think about how you solve those problems. If you adopt the right approaches, uh, it can be very fun as you, uh, as you go through your uh, academic or professional career. So I'd like to spend about 25 minutes. I'll just share with you some of my thoughts uh, on the approach to innovation, how to be successful at innovation. Uh, I'd like to share with you a little bit of my thought of where the industry is at right now, the inflection point uh, that we face in this industry. Uh, and we will have time for question and answer uh, at the completion. So let me start uh, just a bit. As I said, I've, I've uh, been in the industry um, almost 40 years. And so when you look at the, the first uh, computers that I, that I worked on, uh, you know, guess what? They, they were pretty big. Uh, they, were, they were not the degree of miniaturization that we have today. Uh, and, you know, when, when you look at, um, you know, my history, I started with years at, at IBM, having a chance to really uh, take that company, which was really a, such a leader in so many computing advances in the 70s and 80s, 90s, and, you know, still, uh, you know, today pushing the, uh, the frontiers of uh, technology. And, you know, we worked on, uh, actually, the company had been largely using bipolar transistors for its, uh, its big computing, its, its heavy tasks. And uh, when I joined, it was also an inflection point. Uh, the company was switching first from that a bipolar junction transistor to an NMOS transistor, a planar NMOS transistor, and then to complementary metal oxide. So CMOS, which has been you know, such a, a, a key technology for decades uh, in our industry, uh, really leading us uh, to such a strong Moore's Law progression. And I'll talk a little bit more about Moore's Law later. Uh, but it, you know, it's really uh, has been a, a time uh, where I, I got to see tremendous change. And what I, what I learned, uh, right away was to embrace problems. Uh, we were such a small team uh, at IBM at the time doing this transition into these new NMOS and CMOS technologies, technologies that we had to behave like a startup. So as we faced problems, we simply had to uh, figure out how to innovate and work together as a small team. Uh, there was not the computer-aided design, electronic uh, design automation, EDA industry that we have today. It didn't exist at the time. So we actually uh, had a team of programmers uh, that were helping us uh, write techniques to uh, take our, our VLSI uh, designs. Now, VLSI, very large scale integration at the time, uh, had fractions of the number of transistors we have today, uh, but it was still at the time uh, you know, a daunting task. It could not be done manually by hand. Uh, so we had to innovate and, and write the programs uh, to help us uh, complete the placement and the routing of our transistors as we designed them. Uh, and then as a small team, we followed it right into manufacturing and shepherded it through the build and walked into the lab and probed the, the transistors and characterized them and made sure they behave. So what an opportunity it was uh, to work from start to finish, from a register transfer language um, a, of, a, of a design of a task that we were trying to do with the chip uh, to the very transistors and EDA used to build it, and then onto the fab uh, to actually build the devices. And, you know, uh, you know as we progressed, uh, we ended up building uh, large computers. So uh, what I show you there uh, is, is one of the uh, uh, first supercomputers. This was uh, called ASCII White, and it used the Power 3 microprocessor. And Power 3 used uh, an, an, an advanced uh, you know, microarchitectural design, but it also from process technology uh, was the first to use metal uh, actually copper metallization, uh, which of course reduced the resistance and the capacitance, allowed us to get a more, a more uh, dense design and more performant design. Uh, the only problem was uh, it, it, it uh, didn't work uh, initially. It had some manufacturing uh, difficulties. And you know, what did I learn? What I learned is it could have been easy for us as the design team to sit back and say, well, that's the manufacturing team's problem. They need to go fix it. Uh, but that's that's not the way that the biggest problems are solved. They're solved by collaboration. And so what what we did at, at that time uh, was uh, really collaborated and, and adjusted the design and the process was adjusted and have, and it led to success. And, and there you see a, a photo uh, of the uh, of the resulting supercomputer uh, using that power three design. You know, I give you an example uh, from uh, Apple. 
Uh, you know, I, I uh, joined Apple. Uh, I was hired by uh, Steve Jobs in 2008 uh, to uh, take over the iPhone design. And, and it was uh, a challenge. We were just uh, bringing to market 3GS, iPhone 3GS, and completing that. And we had a lot of lessons learned. But iPhone 4, we stacked uh, his, the most innovations that have ever been packed in a single release of an iPhone uh, because it had... Uh, you know, it had a front and back glass. It had a CNC metal band, a beautiful metal band, as you see on the outside. It used a new type of glass, a corning from corning, the manufacturer corning. It was called a gorilla glass, a much tougher glass. Uh, it introduced a new camera technology, uh, FaceTime uh, technology to uh, allow you to uh, readily uh, uh, video conference with friends or uh, work associates with your phone. So many, many uh, uh, challenges uh, that we had. And what, what I found uh, there, uh, again, we had a number of big problems, but the common theme, it took collaboration. It took collaboration of our phone design team uh, with the industrial design team that had uh, you know, designed the, you know, these uh, you know, key uh, elements uh, that made the phone look so beautiful. Uh, and we really had to iterate. So we did multiple design iterations uh, to make sure uh, that, you know, that each of these uh, technology were robust. And, you know, inevitably we ran into problems, uh, but I couldn't be more proud how the team came together and worked across disciplines uh, to, uh, to solve them uh, to, and to make software, hardware, uh, third party uh, suppliers all team together uh, to create uh, a beautiful design, which um, actually uh, was the uh, longest running uh, design in uh, iPhone uh, history. Uh, it stayed in market uh, over uh, several generations. And then, uh, and then AMD. Uh, when you look at uh, I had the opportunity uh, to join AMD 10 years ago, it'll be 10 years ago uh, next month. And it's just been a, a phenomenal opportunity. Uh, and uh, again, an opportunity to really uh, think about problem solving. Uh, when I joined AMD, uh, it had a storied history and in innovation. Uh, but uh, our microprocessor competitors had fallen off at the time. So we needed to rally. We needed to rally the, the, the team. Uh, we needed to set our goals very, very high. We needed to set our goals for leadership. And the way uh, that we did that was we had good clarity of what problems will we solve. Uh, the team, you know, getting the right uh, leaders, the right uh, uh, technical um, expertise, calling out the challenges and deciding equally as important what we would do with the Zen design and what we would not do so that we could focus on the elements uh, that would have the highest impact of a leadership x86 CPU, uh, as well as uh, you know designing to be a family of processors. So we actually had, while we worked on generation number one, we had uh, the successive uh, generations uh, in uh, concept phase. And so that way we knew that not only would we uh, be able to bring uh, AMD back to a leadership position in CPU, but keep it there uh, with overlapping teams that could keep successive generations coming to market on time and keeping our customers uh, satisfied and keeping us on the pace of innovation uh, that, that would ensure uh, that AMD can stay uh, competitive in leadership going forward. So again, what's the, what's the common theme across all of those is, is to embrace problem solving. Uh, problem solving leads to innovation. And so, uh, you know, it's been, uh, uh, I'm so thrilled with the uh, opportunities I've had and that we, that we have going forward. Uh, but, but uh, you know, really innovation uh, is fundamentally uh, underneath uh, all great products that you see. And it's innovation coupled with uh, the kind of, of uh, culture uh, that, that you take on. And you start learning about culture uh, you know, from your days at the university, you know, think about the classes that you take. Now, some of it you study individually as you're learning to be uh, a subject matter expert in a specific area. Uh, but rapidly in your curriculum, uh, you you will begin working on teams. You'll be you'll you'll start solving problems in, in, in teams. By the way, uh, I've uh, not had a chance to visit your campus, but I've seen photos, uh, and it's a, a such a stunning campus uh, right on the riverside. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, clearly one of the most uh, beautiful IIT locations. So it must be hard uh, to, uh, to uh, keep your focus on the studies at such a beautiful area. Uh, but uh, with the reputation uh, of uh, your school, I know uh, that's exactly what you do. 
But what I challenge you to do is think about not just that subject matter material, but how you can start even in your uh, studies at the university to think about culture. What is it uh, that you do as you go about and you uh, solve a, uh, you know, um, problems as you try and drive innovation? And what I'll really highlight to you is what I have found is four key fundamentals of the culture. Uh, this is what I've uh, talked to my team constantly about at AMD. Uh, and that's really uh, first having a culture of transparency. Transparency meaning be, be very open. Uh, don't don't hold back uh, your ideas or uh, think about yourself. Uh, think about being very open as you talk to people on um, on on what do you think are some positive as well as the challenges. Put the challenges that you see uh, out in the open. Discuss them because if you if you don't be transparent um, and you don't have that type of open communications, uh, it's very hard to kind of create the teamwork of problem solving you want. And then of course that's the next. Uh, item that I would highlight to you under culture, and that's problem solving. Be crisp, define, write down the problem that you're solving. So you've been transparent, you're working together openly, be clear on, on, the, uh, on the problem uh, that you're making, uh, then make decisions. Number three uh, is to have a culture of decision making. Uh, it's important to come together and again, decide how you will attack those problems. Uh, and to be very, very clear, because that's what keeps everyone on a team aligned, is if you have a clarity of that decision making. Uh, and, and then, of course, is risk management. Uh, so as you made the decision of how you're solving a problem or how you're creating a new great product or a new idea, uh, make sure that you've identified the risk and being able to talk about the risk and, and how you will test and have milestones along the way to be sure that you can and be successful. And if you, if you see you can't, then it's important to call that out and to back up and to address, uh, you know, a problem or a risk, uh, which has uh, proved to be, you know, a big problem and needs extra effort. So those are four areas I'd highlight to you in terms of uh, culture. And then, you know, I also urge everyone to think about uh, not just the, the culture that you have in the team, but how you create the team. Uh, it's it's very important, uh, you know, as you as you have a team to um, have different ways of thinking. Uh, you want a dreamer, someone that you know is really very, very creative. Uh, you want someone who might be um, more of a deep expert in certain areas in multi uh, disciplines. Uh, you probably want someone who is a contrarian, someone who not just is nodding their head and agreeing with everything, uh, but someone who will challenge uh, and and have the uh, group uh, you know uh, do better. And then, of course, uh, really everybody needs to be a, a good communicator. Uh, and so that's something uh, that, you know, that, that you want as part of the uh, team characteristic. And when that all comes together and you have that culture of innovation and uh, you know, transparency and problem solving and the other uh, features I described, and you combine it with a diverse team makeup, amazing things happen. That's how you can get uh, you know, inventions that you didn't even dream possible, uh, new approaches that you, you that were not even in your head as you uh, as you started the effort. So again, the culture of innovation and how you put teams together are really fundamental and something I urge you to think about uh, even in uh, your days at the university. And you know, why do we need that uh, now more than ever? Uh, is uh, we are at an, a yet another inflection point. You might say, well, Mark, we've, we've always had, uh, you know, the need for more and more data and applications. True, absolutely true. Uh, but what we're seeing now is a true explosion because the amount of data that we have being generated around us, you see it, you see the internet of things where all the devices around you are smart. Uh, you're, uh, you know, you can see uh, in these modern homes where uh, everything is connected, you know, the, you know, it's uh, automation has come uh, into a number of these modern homes. And you can see in the factory floor, uh, there's telemetry on an instrumentation uh, that, that's allowing us to change how we optimize, uh, you know, our, our uh, product manufacturing. You see it in agriculture where uh, drones can go over a field of crops and, and create a, a very detailed visual images and identify where there might be a disease or areas that are not getting a proper hydration, et cetera. And so I could go on and on, uh, but you see it. There's just an explosion of data and data is 
gives you the ability to do things, to, to harness that data, put it to use. Uh, and that in turn drives more and more computing. And it drives computing um, in the biggest supercomputers in the cloud, that's, that's natural. Uh, but more and more that need for the analytics and the ability to reduce that data uh, down to a manageable set is moving to the edge and right into the uh, endpoints. And then more and more visualization to take that data uh, and, and be able to analyze it. Uh, and, and of course, um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, advent of more and more realistic gaming uh, is also uh, driving just an explosion. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, going forward. Very exciting uh, in this world. And of course, you know, what that means is, is that we cannot slow down uh, on that pace of providing more computing that we have uh, year after year. And I said I would talk to you a little bit more about Moore's Law. Well, Moore's Law means that we you know, double the number of transistors uh, and keep a semiconductor device at about the same cost and power uh, every two years. And that Moore's Law you know, just uh, you know, worked for you know, decades. Uh, most, m- much of my career uh, benefited from uh, Moore's Law. But Moore's law has slowed. Uh, And so what you're doing is you're getting more packing density, more transistors every node, but uh, it uh, takes uh, much more cost. Uh, It's not running at the higher, you know, it's not, you're not able to keep pace at frequency and not all of the transistor types are able to scale uh, to these new semiconductor nodes, uh, particularly, uh, you know, uh, RAM, you know, uh, memory uh, structures or analog mixed signals are not scaling. And so it's going to take more innovation, and, and that will happen. But we'll, we've fallen off that traditional Moore's law. So Moore's law is there, we'll, but it, it needs um, more design elements to be able to keep on this pace of doubling the amount of CPU and GPU capability that we have every two years, every a little bit over two years. That's been the historical trend, and we uh, absolutely can stay on that Uh, exponential pace uh, if we continue uh, to drive uh, the innovation. Uh, And that, you know, so that's, that's really the, the, the challenge that I have to each of you and why I feel it's such an exciting time, this combination of a tipping point, such an explosion of need for more computation because of the, the, uh, the amount of vast data uh, that needs to be analyzed to make it useful. And then the need for innovation to keep us, on our historical pace of computation capacity. So a couple of examples that I'll go through and, 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 and before I conclude. And the first is, you know, just a reminder to you as I, I'll start, talk to you about graphics. Graphics is compute intensive. Um, there's a, a 3D model uh, that's being generated of every device, every uh, image before it's being rendered. Uh, we create what's called, you know, a wire model. It's, it's not, in the old days, it was a real physical model. <laughs> but uh, now, of course, uh, it's a 3D uh, rendered model. Uh, but, but it, you know, you, uh, it, you require, um, you know, very intense uh, modeling capabilities uh, to be able to then uh, first uh, create a, uh, a, you know, a base uh, 3D solid model. Um, uh, which, w- which would be an efficient uh, representation, and then to create an animation of that frame. So, so uh, really apply the physics, once you have that model, of how it reacts uh, around it to uh, forces being applied on it. Uh, it might be sunlight that's reflecting off of it. It might be movement. Um, you know, each of these require uh, a, you know, a tremendous amount of computation. Uh, and, and that is... Uh, what I really uh, highlight to you is if uh, those of you in uh, this area of visualization, uh, this is already your area of expertise. Uh, so there's nothing new to you, but I just highlight to you, you know, again, the, the you know, the, the uh, deep uh, use of algorithms that we do uh, across our graphics processors. Uh, so our GPUs are incredibly dense uh, and, and they are uh, packed uh, to be able to facilitate both vector and matrix math ca- computation. And they're adaptable, right? To, say it, it, to uh, program it based on your algorithms. And that's, that's fundamental uh, for uh, both graphics and then uh, compute, which I'll talk about in a second. But you think about the, the visualization uh, aspects and the rendering. 
uh, you're, you're simulating the interaction of, of lights and moving objects and the materials. Uh, so, you know, the examples I, I give you when you think about a game, the, the more natural it looks, uh, the more complex the algorithms are. Uh, think about if you're playing a video game, uh, the old video games, the characters had no hair or they would be wearing a hat. Why is that? Because we didn't have the compute uh, capacity yet to do the physics modeling of how the hair would even move as, as, the, as the person walked or the wind blow. But now, of course, we have that. And so you see, you see a natural flow of, uh, of hair as there's movement. Uh, we do the same with a ray tracing as we've added a ray tracing capability so that uh, we, are, we are doing, we have algorithms that, that mimic uh, light as it bounces off uh, the objects uh, in, uh, in, you know, in the frame. Uh, and it's, and it is lifelike because it's, it's modeling exactly what happens uh, to a normal uh, uh, ray of light uh, in the real world. And so the algorithms uh, must continue uh, to, uh, to uh, better model uh, and create more lifelike Im images. And that's exactly what you're seeing. So if you go look at our, our, uh, our, our, you know, latest uh, generations, uh, you look at the new game consoles from uh, Sony, from Microsoft, or our recently uh, released Radeon 6000. It, it, it's just amazing uh, when you watch on a 4K display or even an 8K display. It's truly lifelike, uh, given the, the uh, algorithms that we're deploying and the compute capacity uh, that we have in our graphics processors. And just to show you, uh, you know, a bit of a uh, you know, indication of that. Uh, I'll show you uh, just a video. This is from uh, Terminator uh, Dark Fate. This came out in uh, November of 2019. So uh, about a year and a half ago, a little over. And it, it really pushed the envelope of computation. It, uh, the director uh, used um, uh, AMD technology. It was Tim Miller's Blue Studio that uh, used our technology uh, to really, uh, you know, uh, create these lifelike images. I'm going to just start the video here. Right. And I want to pause it in just a moment because you, you, you're seeing, depending on your display, you're, you're seeing, uh, you know, certainly uh, high resolution. Uh, but what I really want to, to show you is, uh, you know, just uh, some of the, uh, you know, computation underneath. And so you saw, uh, you know, that we break down each of these images and you're seeing these digital models. So, so this is, you know, in this, uh, in this trailer, uh, we they actually broke down and showed you the, the model that they were building on uh, to create that lifelike uh, simulation. So that, you know, this is a chance for you to see a little bit of that, that combination of the uh, 3D a physical model, uh, which then is is uh, is then you know then uh, uh, simulated a very very uh, dense uh, computation of our discrete uh, CPUs, uh, our discrete GPUs working with our uh, Ryzen uh, CPUs. So uh, really incredible uh, what you what you can ha have in uh, today's technology. Okay, let me go to the next slide. And I'll shift gears and, and talk uh, just a bit about uh, CPU computation. And, you know, the, again, you know, inexorable pace, uh, doubling of CPU computation uh, that, that we're seeing, uh, you know, every uh, two plus years. And, you know, you look at, um, you know, the, the approach that we have, it's a multi-year process for us to uh, develop uh, each new CPU. It's about a three-year process. Uh, we start with the high-level design uh, where we, you know, really spend the time to identify what are we doing in terms of changing uh, the fundamental uh, microarchitectural um, elements. What are we doing with uh, how we uh, do our branch prediction? Uh, what are we doing to be able uh, to uh, dispatch uh, very, very efficiently? Uh, what are we doing to, uh, to be able from a a, uh, a cash hierarchy standpoint to make sure that as we add more compute capability that we feed those engines in a very, very balanced way. And then we move through the cycle. We move through the, the, the feasibility phase of, of testing out those ideas. Then we start the implementation of the register uh, transfer logic and, and, um, and the circuit designs. And then of course, a very extensive design verification phase. You know, we're taking now billions of transistors putting them together and achieving the first pass silicon, we booted up uh, within a matter of uh, hours uh, and have uh, functionality of, of these very, very complex CPUs. And 
uh, that's a testament to where the technology is today. And it's a must because it, each time you create a mass set to build one of these new CPUs, it's millions upon uh, millions of, of, uh, of dollars uh, to be able to build that. So, uh, you know, really uh, the um, uh, uh, techniques uh, to drive a CPU leadership uh, have advanced tremendously, and then we must continue uh, to be able to uh, grow those capabilities. And I'll just show you an example of um, the Zen 3, just some of those elements. So the result of that design process, uh, this is a, the um, uh, x86 uh, leadership CPU, which we're shipping today. So it has a single thread, multi-thread leadership. Uh, we design uh, an eight core complex. Uh, so as we then scale to uh, server applications or high performance of workstations that might have 16, 32, up to 64 cores in a single uh, chip carrier. Uh, we have the modularity that we build around that eight core uh, complex. Uh, and as well, uh, we doubled uh, the L3 that is directly accessible uh, by the cores in that eight core complex uh, and, and made a number of other improvements. So leading to a 19% gen over gen uh, improvement in instruction per clock, uh, just a phenomenal single generation improvement uh, that, that propelled us to uh, what is absolutely a, you know, a leadership position. And I, I won't go through the detail here, but again, just breaking out where do we get that 19% of microarchitectural uh, benefit of instruction per clock, uh, it takes a, a number of elements. So again, what did I say earlier on, uh, on the, uh, the art of innovation? It takes, uh, it, it takes collaboration across multiple groups, identifying the problem, what are the things you're gonna do, and then you know, uh, really uh, focusing on uh, making those decisions and managing the risk to deliver that product uh, to our customers on time uh, and, and delivering that, that, key, uh, that key value. So uh, I'm gonna speed up just a, a little bit, but you know, I am gonna talk a, a bit about a, a, a data science. I mean, when you look at uh, the algorithms right now uh, that are needed to uh, really analyze that vast amount of data that I was talking about uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, you know, we're really just seeing um, you know, a resurgence uh, in uh, data science and such uh, innovation going into the algorithms. Uh, I'm, I'm so impressed. And you know, again, I, I, I talked earlier uh, about uh, that explosion of data, but you just look at some of these uh, stats. I mean, it's just pretty amazing. Um, look at the model size of, you know, a hundred billion parameters. And this data is about a, a year old of the uh, turn model. Uh, you know, when you look at like a GPT-3 and a natural language generation uh, that Microsoft's been working on, just the model size alone is, uh, is massive. Uh, and because of the amount of data that it needs to to train and to get that kind of ac accurate uh, natural language uh, generation, which is their task. And of course, uh, a number of other uh, examples as well uh, that we have with this explosion of data. But what, what that means is, uh, is that we needed breakthroughs in, in how we harness that data. What I said earlier, how do you put that data uh, to use? Uh, and you know, thankfully about uh, you know, nine years ago, uh, there was really the, the seminal work uh, that really expanded the use of the, the, the gradient descent uh, analysis uh, technique that really allowed us uh, to minimize uh, the loss function and, you know, and take the difference between um, you know, the, the uh, end uh, estimated value and the actual value. And then uh, recursively through uh, you know, neural nets, um, you know, use that uh, stochastic gradient descent analysis uh, to, uh, to really optimize uh, the, the problem. Uh, uh, it's, excuse me. It built on it built on this the original stochastic approaches uses, but the gradient descent analysis that uh, deployed right now has now led to yet uh, multiple different algorithms uh, used in machine learning. So depending on the kind of data that you have um, and the, the kind of uh, uh, best learning, uh, it's just amazing uh, the plethora of algorithms. And you know that's why at, at uh, AMD we've invested in uh, optimized GPUs now. So we have um, uh, two lines of discrete graphics. One, the RDNA line that creates that type of beautiful visualization that I shared with you a moment ago is used in in uh, the, the Terminator Dark Fate clip that I showed you. And we have the cDNA line. It's a compute optimized. Uh, graphics compute core, where we take out some of the circuitry uh, for the visualization and focus all on uh, compute and give 
uh, programmers the flexibility. So as they want to change algorithms, uh, we give them uh, flexibility uh, to really, uh, you know, create that recursive learning and create uh, the more uh, lifelike, um, excuse me, the more much more accurate uh, results uh, that we need, uh, you know, to have, uh, you know, AI. Uh, what I have to say right now is I'm seeing it basically pervade almost every application. Uh, you're seeing, uh, you know, an AI training and then usually a real-time inferencing uh, in, in so many uh, applications. Uh, the, you know, the most obvious ones, of course, is, uh, you know, that uh, voice recognition that you have on, you know, that you probably use every day on your phone. Uh, but in industry, uh, everywhere that we're generating data, uh, we pretty much are applying an AI algorithm uh, to put that, uh, to put that uh, data to use. And then, you know, just, uh, you know, looking on as to how we see uh, this going uh, in the future, uh, you know, what we're seeing is that, that um, you know, we're really uh, having to push uh, really, uh, you know, the, the training uh, more into the GPUs. That's what you typically see today. Ourself and our competitor, uh, you know, are providing uh, these uh, compute optimized uh, training uh, bases. Uh, and, and you're seeing uh, inference largely CPU based today. But where is it going? Uh, you're seeing now that it's really going to heterogeneous computing. Uh, it's CPU and GPU. It's CPU and GPU and, and custom chips. Uh, which are being used to, uh, uh, once an algorithm is stabilized, uh, you can put a custom application specific IC against it. Uh, where you can see FPGAs being used much more, particularly in inferencing, where you can tailor an inferencing application at the edge uh, and marry it with, uh, with that uh, CPU for very uh, efficient real-time uh, inferencing. So we're just seeing a lot of change on, on, uh, from the traditional uh, just a standalone CPU and GPU uh, to integrated uh, heterogeneous uh, structures. And uh, we've been very, very focused on that. It's really supercomputing uh, that's, that's uh, led the way uh, in this because, you know, when you, you think about uh, the demand of the, the big universities, I'm sure it, at uh, your IIT, you're pushing the edge of supercomputing uh, with some of the complex uh, high-performance compute algorithms. But what I really see uh, is almost a convergence of uh, HPC uh, and AI in terms of the type of computing that we have. You, you need both vector and matrix, um, you know, super uh, density and, and efficiency uh, in your supercomputing. And that's what we've turned our GPUs. And we've, we've, uh, we've uh, generated uh, an approach that allows heterogeneity uh, between the CPU and GPU and other elements uh, to be uh, more advanced, we developed an open software stack, Radeon Open Compute, uh, to allow that CPU and GPU to work closely together. Uh, in the supercomputer that we're starting production shipment of now, uh, the first uh, customer is the United States Department of Energy with the Frontier 1.5 exaflop machine and starting production shipment now, the CPU and GPU are coherent. What does that mean for a programmer is they're not needing to manage at a low level of the data sets that they're working on between the CPU and GPU. Uh, so it makes the programming much uh, easier uh, as well as uh, significantly aiding the performance uh, as workloads may go across uh, CPU and, and GPU. So that, that kind of uh, heterogeneity, uh, it, it's, it's really here to stay. Uh, when you look at what it's doing, it's, it's allowing us uh, to adapt the computing uh, for the workload, you know, you look at these workloads, um, you know, they're not all made the same um, where, where you, you know, you have, uh, let's say a cloud application that's using just a broad variety of general purpose workloads. That's going to be a general purpose. It's going to be typically an x86 uh, the CPU based approach. And we've done very well there uh, with our uh, Epic uh, uh, computers. Uh, but uh, again, as you get uh, the, uh, the more and more pervasive use of these tailored algorithms, uh, you're needing to add uh, you know, general purpose uh, GPUs, as I described, and then semi-custom and FPGA. So you're seeing more and more tailored computing that's, that's required to keep pace. And how we put it together, uh, it needs more flexibility. We've innovated in AMD on chiplets, the modular approach, leveraging our infinity architecture to be able to scale as we put CPUs together, CPUs and GPUs are, are, are again, you know, um, you know, different uh, combinations, including uh, unique and novel memory uh, architectures, which are coming to bear. So no lack of innovation in terms of how we can uh, architect and put uh, these compute 
solutions together. And, you know, uh, before I complete, I'd be remiss if I really didn't spend time on, on the, the software. Um, the challenge is more and more now the software. We're, we've uh, made the decision at AMD uh, to, you know, to focus on uh, open source uh, to really speed software development. That's really the gate uh, to getting end applications, more broad uh, use of this type of a heterogeneous compute architecture. And so again, we've made that Radeon Open Compute uh, available. Uh, we have a lot of partners and, and are now partnering with a, a number of these uh, big hyperscale uh, cloud companies, along with national labs and universities around the world, uh, so that we can speed uh, the ease of programming. Our goal is that you can write at a C++ high level with simple pragmas that identify the vector matrix uh, you know, uh, 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 structures that you have. Uh, and we believe that will bring many more uh, programmers and really ease the adoption of these heterogeneous systems, which are required to keep us on a Moore's law pace. And so, you know, just uh, rapidly, just to show you that that pace we've had, I mean, look at a, uh, you know, a, 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 a 2000 uh, computer at 3.2 teraflops, uh, to you know the single uh, MI100. That's the we're shipping. Uh, that's a Radeon uh, Instinct, uh, AMD Instinct uh, uh, MI100. We're shipping today. It's a leader ship capability of 11 and a half teraflops of HPC that you hold in the palm of your hand, equal to uh, the supercomputer of uh, you know back in in 2000. It's just amazing uh, what happens as we as we stay on this on this pace. And that's exactly what we'll do. As I said, we're entering the exaflop era. Uh, we'll be there at, a, uh, at AMD, we'll lead the way. We partnered with Cray, we're providing the CPU and GPU uh, a heterogeneous complex, a coherent heterogeneous complex for the uh, Oak Ridge National Labs uh, computer, uh, and then an over two exaflop machine in 2023. So uh, we are entering the exaflop area. It's very, very exciting. And, um, you know, uh, much, much more uh, to come. I, I could not um, uh, say enough about how uh, we are incredibly focused on collaboration and partnership. Uh, we do a lot uh, with the Indian uh, universities. I'm uh, at AMD. I'm the sponsor uh, for uh, our uh, India teams. We have uh, several thousand uh, engineers, uh, actually uh, uh, over 2,000 engineers, but on its way as we um, are, are bringing together uh, AMD with Xilinx, we're going to complete the acquisition uh, targeting um, uh, end of this year as projected. Uh, and that, that will have us, uh, you know, having a, a presence of thousands of engineers in India. And we look forward to continuing uh, the uh, long tradition of partnership and collaboration uh, we have uh, with uh, Indian universities to drive this pace of innovation uh, going forward. So I want to make sure I have time for our Q&A. So I'm going to bring it to, uh, uh, to a uh, conclusion here uh, and just, just tell you that um, I, I'm so excited to just uh, share with you, you know, my thoughts of where we're at today. We're at an inflection point, and it just couldn't have a better time for you to have influence, for you to impact where this industry is going moving forward. Um, you know, it, it, it is about uh, hardware and software coming together. If the one point that I'll make to you is that, that you know, please, in your studies, uh, make sure you're thinking about multidisciplinary uh, solutions that we need uh, to keep computing on that exponential uh, pace of improving our compute capacity. And lastly, just think about some of the cultural elements and the team elements that drive collaboration, which are so fundamental to not only solving some of the most difficult problems, but having fun uh, while you're doing so. So thanks very much for, uh, for uh, having me here and, and I'd be glad uh, to spend a, a few moments with you on, on Q&A. That was truly an incredible lecture, sir. Thank you so much. Our audience has been incredibly responsive and has bombarded us with questions. It's time we take them up. Um, so the first question is from Shweta. What is the reason for the difficulty in commercializing transistor designs that allow for gaps smaller than seven nanometers? Although it's implemented in labs, why do we not, them, not have them in common man systems? What is the challenge here? Yes, you know, it's a great question, Swetan. Uh, so again, Moore's law uh, is still applicable, but I said it's slowed. Why has it slowed? Uh, it is physics. Uh, what we're now seeing is that uh, there's really only a few molecules between the gate 
uh, and the the carriers is source and drain. So as you make a transistor for any, that's how any you know switching operation is done. You as you build that basic transistor, uh, you're seeing you know that we're now down to just several molecules. Uh, you know, just uh, providing an insulator between the traditional, uh, between the gate and the source drain of a traditional CMOS structure. So what it's driving is new invention. So CMOS, so I, I told you at the beginning, we went from bipolar junction transistors and they were becoming so power hungry that people at the time thought, oh, that's the end of the semiconductor industry. That's it, we're done. Uh, there, there won't be anything beyond that BJT. And then along came NMOS and then CMOS and the ball kept being moved forward. Well, we're at, we're at another one of those junctures. Uh, so uh, we had gone from a straight a planar CMOS to a fin, a, a vertical gate structure. And now what you're seeing to go um, beyond a seven nanometer, what you're seeing is new types of lithography, extreme ultraviolet, uh, it's a very expensive. It takes it's the size of a you know almost an auditorium. If any of you are watching from a you know a large room at a large auditorium, that would be the size of the photolithography tool uh, to be able to to print the very very small dimensions that are required as you go below a seven nanometer. Uh, and so it takes new tooling and it's taking new device structures. Uh, there's a lot of invention going on uh, about how to even change how that transistor is laid out, but it is happening. There is the innovation, the problem solving, the risk management, it's all occurring. And so it's taking a little bit longer between each of these successive nodes, uh, but you'll see uh, we're, we're already working on uh, our next generation uh, 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 Zen uh, that's a, a plan for 2022 that will be in the five nanometer uh, technology. And then you can see from the, the fabrication facilities, uh, they have plans for uh, three nanometer and, and, uh, and beyond. So. Uh, it's harder, uh, but the pace of innovation continues. That is really exciting for us, and I hope that that answers your question, Shweta. Okay, the second question is that chips are chips that are designed for a very specific or particular kind of process often outperform those that are and that are designed for a general use. Mm -hmm. What is the level of Im improvement that we can bring to these customized chips? And is the cost similar to the general chips? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, as I showed, you know, those specialized chips do provide more performance. Typically, to cover the cost of doing a specialized chip, you really need to be an order of magnitude more performant in a very in that very specific task than the general chip. Why? Because when you can create a, a generalized chip at mass volume. What do I mean by mass volume? I mean, the CPUs that we sell, the GPUs we sell, we sell tens of millions of these devices. So you have mass manufacturing economy of scale, so we can bring that cost down. And so well, how can you afford uh, you know, to, to build a specialized device that you might make in a far less volume? Uh, you need to have a typically uh, an order of magnitude more performance. Again, if you don't have the volume, if someone has a very, very large volume, they can apply the, um, uh, those economies of scale, uh, but uh, typically that's not the case. Uh, and and uh, the, the challenge with those specialized customized chips is often they're tailored to a specific algorithm, a specific approach. And that's fine if that algorithm is stable and it will last for years. Uh, but where the algorithms change, then you, know, you typically go back to a CPU, GPU, or an FPGA that you can adapt, uh, an adaptable computing uh, that you can, uh, you can handle that change. But that, that's that's typically what I see is, you know, a very significant uh, performance uh, uh, differential required uh, before people uh, typically invest in that specialized chip. And these specialized chips don't replace general purpose. The, the, the capacity needs of the industry are going so vastly. There's room for, you know, there's still a very strong and growing market for these general purpose uh, CPU, GPUs, or adaptable uh, computing, and there's and there's uh, the need and room in this market uh, for these tailored devices as well. As I said, it's a very exciting time. Yes, that does sound like a very exciting time. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Sh uh, Shalvika. As we move forward with time in technology and engineering, do you agree with the fact that we are making more non 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 long-lasting products, that is the pr practice of pr plant obs obsolescence, 
uh, since we have limited resources, isn't this a step backwards instead? What are your opinions on this and what should we do? It, it's a great uh, question. I recently attended a panel session with uh, a number of other chief technology officers in the industry. And the topic was sustainability. What can we do uh, as uh, leaders across the technology industry uh, to address sustainability? How do we uh, in ensure uh, one, it is a longer device use. So um, I'll talk about that in, in just a minute, but it's also uh, uh, energy uh, efficiency. So the, the, these massive uh, scale of, um, of uh, growth of computing drives a massive uh, burn of energy and it, and it affects the sustainability of our, of our planet. Uh, so uh, we're all uh, focused on that. At AMD, we just completed a project uh, that we called uh, 25 by 20. We had committed uh, in uh, 2017, uh, we had committed that uh, that uh, by, uh, uh, actually it was 2016, we made the commitment that over the next five years, uh, we would commit to a, a 25X improvement in the energy efficiency of our laptops. And we did that. When you look at the uh, Renoir based uh, uh, Ryzen PCs that you see out in market today. We even have the generation beyond that, uh, the Zen 3 based generation shipping now. But the, with the Zen 2 based generation, we achieved a 25x uh, improvement in energy efficiency. And uh, we'll soon be announcing a similar challenge that we're doing uh, for our servers uh, to be able to drive uh, energy efficiency uh, dramatically forward. Uh, and, and likewise, on, on being able to use devices longer. Uh, you know, it really uh, uh, is important that we have foresight in uh, thinking about the standards that we use uh, for our, our software and not and making sure uh, that they have longevity for, so that the software can run on prior uh, generations. Uh, and that's something that we continue to work uh, with the operating system vendors on. Uh, but it, it is a challenge because they have pressure to provide new features. And sometimes the newest features can't run on, uh, on much older uh, generation. But as long as they still support that prior generation of operating system, uh, we can extend the life uh, of our uh, computers. And of course, servers, servers last a long time. When people buy servers, they keep them in operation a, a number of years and they just grow with the new generations. They add more capacity, but we have a, a you know, good life of products uh, and server applications. Uh, and as well as um, uh, both, both CPU and, and, uh, and GPU. But yes, yeah, so we all need to collaborate and work together on sustainability. It's, it, it's a worldwide uh, issue that can only be solved in that way. Thank you. I, I hope that answers your questions, Shalvika. The next question is, can you describe the process, the chain of thoughts that goes into making the intricate systems, system on chips in the microprocessor? Yes. Um, well, the, the, the process of designing a system on chip, that is what we do. Everything that we uh, develop is a system on chip. Because of the degree of integration uh, we're putting together on a single chip, really all the elements you have uh, needed to, to have a, a full computer. So if you look at our, our CPU chip, we call it a CPU chip, but it really represents what used to be multiple chips. And in fact, uh, if you took the cover off of one of ours, often you see that we have little chiplets where we've segregated some of the elements. Um, it looks like one to you because it's all in one carrier, so you can just plug it in. Uh, but our system on a chip um, you know, typically has on it uh, the CPU, uh, memory controllers, I.O. controllers, uh, fixed function accelerators. When you look at, I have a, a Lenovo uh, laptop in front of me that has uh, I, uh, an AMD Ryzen processor. And on a single piece of silicon, it has CPU graphics and all of the elements uh, that I need uh, to communicate with you here, including even the image processing for the video that you see me on. Uh, so the way that we do that is we organize teams uh, where uh, each are, uh, we have subgroups, which call IP teams, the intellectual property teams, the IP of a CPU, a GPU, or each of these building elements, but they design it uh, with the methodology where we have to prescribed in advance, how do they connect to the uh, each one another? And then we use our EDA uh, software systems to place and route and stitch them all together uh, and then send this to manufacturing. So you do need to invest in a well-defined system on chip methodology. And now we're moving from system on chip to really system on package. 
where we're getting even more complexity. What used to be a number of components on the motherboard is now becoming a system on package moving forward. So you're seeing more and more integration of functions in the industry. Thank you so much for that enlightening answer. So the next question is, the technological advancements in the medical field needs a lot of push across the world and should be affordable to the economically weaker sections of the society. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so this is a, a daunting challenge and, and, and one it makes me very proud because the kind of thing that we're doing in AMD, trying to take high performance computing and, and make it more affordable and more compact and less energy uh, has direct application in getting healthcare to people that don't have access uh, to big city hospitals and things. So we worked with a medical uh, company, for instance, uh, that uh, you know created a, a very compact and portable ultrasound system. So they were able to take our Ryzen device, again, a very uh, high performance CPU and GPU at low power and embed it uh, in a uh, ultrasound portable application that then can be uh, brought uh, to small cities or rural areas and be applied. And, and we need to see more and more of that, more uh, devices that are being more portable. Also, the very technology that we're using today uh, you know, as we enhanced our audio visual and the ability to send telemetry, that means that uh, doctors in, in the big city uh, can, through telemedicine, more readily uh, treat uh, areas uh, which otherwise would not have appropriate medical care. So there's, uh, it, this is also an area that's going through very quick and rapid change right now uh, and will uh, result in the betterment of uh, medical care, uh, you know, uh, across areas that have been uh, historically underserved. Very true, so very true. The next question is, what are, what are the key differences pertaining to the mode of operation that you experienced in all three companies, Apple, AMD, and Cisco? Uh, if you'd re repeat that one more time, and this will unfortunately have to be the last uh, question just uh, due to uh, uh, time constraints here. Okay, yes. What are the key differences pertaining to the mode of operation that you experienced at the companies that you've worked for? Oh, that's a great question. Well, all of them are innovation based. Uh, I'm, I'm very much about innovation. So I, I um, you know, I went, uh, you know, to areas that uh, I, I felt I could add value. My, uh, my key value uh, is I am very strong on those attributes that I described to you that I'm very good at bringing people together to focus on a problem and drive innovation uh, in my areas of expertise. And I learned a lot of that from uh, IBM. IBM is a story company. Uh, in terms of educating their leaders on, on, on how to be good leaders. Uh, and so they uh, taught me about that rigor. Uh, you know, working with uh, Steve Jobs and Apple uh, really taught me uh, how important the user experience is, not just the technology, but the technology uh, that really can create a much better experience and, and allow people to do things they just couldn't have done without those technology elements. And at AMD, uh, we have a, a tremendous a focus on collaboration innovation uh, between uh, myself with my background. Our CEO is, is uh, Lisa Sue, very technical uh, PhD in electrical and computer engineering. Uh, we're focused on, on providing leadership products, but democratizing how that we, we provide that uh, with open source solutions uh, and really uh, providing uh, uh, wherever we can uh, more economic solutions versus some more entrenched competitors that we go against. So I've been very fortunate to work uh, in very strong innovation-based uh, uh, companies uh, that have uh, really uh, uh, been able to make an impact with the products I've been fortunate to work on. And most, uh, most uh, impactful has been the people that I've been able to work with. Uh, it's been, uh, it's really, you know, to me, that's everything uh, is being able to uh, have a joy out of working uh, with with people. So with that, I, I really want to say uh, thank you very much for having me with you here today. It's just been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for that inspiring discussion, sir. It was truly an honor to have you here with us today. I'd also like to thank all of our audience for being such a responsive and interactive audience. Please remember that this is only the beginning of TechNiche, and with many more exciting lectures coming up this week, including a veteran astronaut tomorrow at 7 p.m., the links to the registration form and our social media handles will be, will be available in the chat box below. Thank you so much and stay safe.